Robert Lanza was called by the New York Times one of the three most important scientists alive today. Just to give you an idea of uh, the caliber of our next presenter. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Mauricio and the organizers for having me here. But I do have to say that yesterday I was at Logan Airport on my way here, and uh, I was just about ready to get on the plane, and Lightning struck the airplane and fried the electronics. And so while I was waiting there for the next airplane, I thought, maybe someone is trying to send me a subtle message. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I would like to talk to you here about biocentrism, which is a new theory of everything which arrives at the same conclusions as non-duality. So every now and then, a very simple but radical idea uh, shakes the foundations of knowledge. So when the discovery of the Earth, uh, that it wasn't flat, challenged the way people perceived themselves in their uh, relationship with the surroundings. Our ancestors were challenged to believe that the Earth was round, even though the ground they walked on was flat. And nothing in everyday experience revealed anything about the truth of this idea. So if the earth was really round, it was argued that people at the bottom would fall off. So it was considered complete nonsense 500 years ago. So likewise, biocentrism uh, is turning the world upside down again with the seemingly simple idea that the universe arises from life, not the other way around. So switching the perspective of the universe from physics to biology undoes everything we know about uh, the universe and, and life in it. We think that life is just an accident of physics, but a long list of experiments suggests exactly the opposite. Amazingly, if you add life and consciousness to the equation, you can explain some of the biggest puzzles in science. For instance, it becomes clear why space and time, indeed the properties of matter themselves, depend on the observer. It also becomes clear why the laws of the universe itself are fine-tuned for the existence of life. So until we recognize the universe in our head, attempts to understand the world uh, remain a road to nowhere. So scientists feel to recognize those properties of life that make it critical for our existence. So the view of the world uh, in which life and consciousness are bottom line to understanding the larger uh, universe is called biocentrism. And it revolves around the way our consciousness relates to a physical process. It's a vast mystery that I've pursued my entire, help, uh, um, uh, my entire life with a lot of help along the way. So I've come to conclusions that would shock many of my colleagues and predecessors, placing biology above the other sciences, in particular physics and chemistry, in an attempt to understand a theory of everything that has eluded these other disciplines. We're taught since, since childhood that the universe is divided into two entities, ourselves and that which is outside of us. So this seems logical. Self is commonly defined by that that we can control. So I can move my fingers, but I can't wiggle your toes. The dichotomy then is based largely on control and manipulation. So the basic biology, however, tells us that we don't control most of the trillions of cells in the body any more than we do control a rock or, or a tree. So consider everything around you right now, me up here at the podium, your hands, your body. Language and custom all say that that's outside us in the external world. But you can't see anything through the vault of bone surrounding your brain. <clears throat> everything you see and experience right now, your body, the walls, the ceilings of this room, are active, an active process that's occurring in your mind. You are this process. You're not just the part that you control. So, so your eyes just aren't portals to the world. You think you just see out there, but again, you can't see through the cranium. So what you're seeing, again, is everything that you think right there is out there is actually a construction happening moment to moment in your mind. So again, I want to emphasize that this is all happening in your head, and even the light from the bulbs in this room, they're moving through a space that's actually created in your mind. So consider everyday reality. So for instance, the weather outside. You see a blue sky out there, but the cells in your brain could be changed so that, the, the, that everything that's, that's blue looks green or red. Could even do a little genetic engineering so that everything that's red makes a noise or vibrates or makes you want to have sex like some birds. Uh, or for instance, you think it's bright out. The circuits in your brain could be changed so that it's, it's dark. You think it's, it's hot and humid, but a to a tropical frog, it would look cold and, and dry. So this logic applies to virtually everything. Bottom line is, and the first principle of biocentrism is, is that, is that reality involves your consciousness. It could not be there without, without your consciousness. 
Emerson once said, we have learned that we do not see directly but immediately and that we have no means for correcting the colored and distorted lenses which we are or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subjective lenses have a creative power. Perhaps there are no objects. So why is everyone surprised at the experimental findings of quantum theory? It's because we're still operating in a severely outdated paradigm. We still believe there's an external world that exists independent of the perceiving subject. So philosophers and physicists from Plato to Hawking have debated this. Niels Bohr, the great Nobel physicist, uh, once said, not so. When we're measuring something, we're forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume an experimental value. We're not measuring the world, we're creating it. And this is from a physicist. And at the legendary debates, Einstein presented ingenious uh, ideas supporting the idea of a real world out there. But Bohr shot every one of them down one by one and gradually convinced his colleagues uh, of his point of view. Uh, today, however, most people still believe there's a, a, an external world out there. This issue, of course, is ancient and, and predates uh, biocentrism, which, which of course explains why one view and not the other uh, has to be correct. So let's consider a little of the, uh, the physics, the real experiments. Consider the famous two-hole experiment. When scientists watch a particle go through two holes in the barrier, it acts like a little bullet and logically goes through one hole or the other. But if you don't watch it, it behaves like a wave and can go, and can go through both holes uh, at the same time. So why should a particle out there change its behavior depending on whether you watch it or not? And of course the answer is that reality is a process that involves your consciousness. Or, and again, there have been many, many versions of that experiment. Uh, consider Eisenberg's famous uncertainty principle. If there was really a world out there with particles just bouncing around, then we should certainly be able to measure all of their properties. But you can't. So for instance, a particle's exact location and its momentum can't be known at the same time. So why should it matter to matter or to particles what you decide to measure? Again, the answer is simple. The particles aren't just out there. Again, we can go on and on. One more entangled particles you've probably heard of. How can particles possibly instantaneously be connected at opposite sides of the galaxy out there in, in violation of, of the speed of light? Again, they're not just out there. Space and time are tools of our mind. They're forms of, of animal understanding. So this is the problem in a nutshell, is, is that we look at the world like a chickmunk or a squirrel. The squirrel opens his eyes and sees the, the acorn and it's just miraculously there. He grabs it and he scurries up the tree without any further thought. And we humans are the same. We wake up in the morning and the world is just magically there. We go through life, we drool completely oblivious to what's going on around us in the world. But experiment after experiment shows that not a single particle out there exists with real properties until it's observed. So it doesn't take a genius to realize that, this, that reality is a process, again, that involves consciousness. So what we need to do is replace the old physics with a new biology. Space and time aren't these hard, cold uh, objects out there. Sort of, sort of like the pebbles and the shells you pick up along the seashore. No, wave your hand through the air. If you take everything away, what's left? Nothing. And the same thing is for time. You can't put it in a bottle like milk. So again, all of experience is just information that's occurring inside your mind. And space and time are the mind's tools for putting it all together. We even do it in dreams with your eyes closed. You can be on the, on the beach with bright lights just as real as we're, we are here in this room. Your mind has the ability to create space and time just like it does in dreams. And in, in schizophrenics, anyone who may be a doctor realizes that those patients see people right beside them in reality just like this, just as real as you and I right now. But that's just part of the, 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 the equation. Again, you know, you have to look at what's going on in, in science, not just with the experiments, but in terms of observation. So it turns out that biocentrism may be the only rational way to explain the structure of the universe itself. So the cosmos, it turns out, has a long list of traits that make it appear as if everything was exactly tailor-made just for us. 
And some are calling this the Goldilocks principles after the old nursery tale of the three bears, bears who try different bowls of porridge. Some of the bowls are too hot, some are too cold. And the bears also try different chairs and beds. And each time the third bear finds that everything is just right. So likewise, the cosmos has an incredibly unlikely list of traits that make it not to this, not to that, uh, for life to exist. So for instance, the Big Bang. If it was one part in a millionth more powerful, it would have rushed out too fast for galaxies and worlds to, to be here. Again, the result, no us. If the strong nuclear force would decrease by 2%, uh, atomic nuclei would not hold together. Plain vanilla uh, uh, hydrogen would be the only uh, element in, in the universe. Again, if the gravitational constant were decreased just a slight, just a hair, stars, including the sun, wouldn't ignite. There are over 200 parameters so exact. These could be any, any number, anything, but they're exactly just right for life to exist. And so, again, if you tweak any of them, you never existed. So none of these are predicted by any theories, and they all seem exactly carefully, uh, carefully to allow for life. And of course, you know, it's been hijacked by intelligent design folks, but it doesn't uh, mitigate the problem of why these constants are all exactly one way when they, they could be millions of other uh, parameters. So one way is, you know, is to say God did it, you know, and the only scientific explanation is, is something called the, the so-called anthropic principle, which says that, that, you know, we must find these conditions because if we're alive, what else could we find? Well, of course, that really isn't an explanation. Uh, you know, that's unless you say there are an infinite number of universes, and we just happen to live in the one lucky one where all the parameters... all the parameters are exactly right. And again, you know, just one in a gazillion, certainly we can do better than that. So obviously no universe that uh, would allow for life could possibly exist from a biocentric point of view. The universe and all of its parameters simply reflect the spatial temporal logic of the animal observer. So it turns out the long sought after theory of everything is really just merely missing one important component that was too close to us to have noticed. So some of the thrill that came with the announcement of the human genome had been mapped or that, uh, that we understand the big, we're understanding the Big Bang, it rests in our desire for completeness and totality. So these comprehensive theories, all of them, feel right now to take into account one critical factor, and that is that we're creating them. That we're the biological creature that fashions the stories, that makes the observations, and it gives names to things. And therein lies the great expanse of, of, of our errors. And that is, is that science hasn't confronted the one thing that's most familiar and most mysterious, and that is, of course, consciousness. So for several centuries, a single mindset has dominated scientific thought. This model has had countless insights and applications that have transformed all of our lives. But it's now reached the end of its useful life. This old model proposes that the universe was until recently just a lifeless collection of particles just bouncing around each other. And they observed, they were following these predetermined rules that were mysterious in their origin. And the universe was presented like this watch that had somehow wound up and then now is, is, is unwinding and allowing for a little quantum uncertainty will unwind in a semi-predictable way. Of course, there are lots of problems with this paradigm, some that are obvious, others that are really mentioned, but just as fundamental. But the overarching problem involves life. In the, how life arise, or arose originally is still an unknown process, uh, even though we can follow it uh, and apprehend what's been going on since through Darwinian uh, mechanisms. The bigger problem is that life contains consciousness, which is, to say the least, poorly understood. So consciousness isn't just a problem, though, for us biologists. It's a problem for physics. And there's nothing in physics that can explain, as you've already heard over and over, how a group of molecules in the brain creates consciousness. So the beauty of the sunset, the taste of a, of a delicious meal, these are all mysteries to science, how, how we subjectively feel that. So how can something we can, you know, in, in neuroscience, we can pin down in the brain uh, where parts of these uh, occur, but it's real, what's really worse is that science can't explain how a matter, I mean, how consciousness arrives from matter. So our understanding of this uh, most basic phenomenon is virtually nil. Interestingly, most of the models of physics don't even recognize this as a problem. 
But let's put aside all of the life and consciousness issues. The current model scientific uh, paradigm leaves a lot to be desired when coming to try to explain the fundamentals of our universe. The universe, indeed, uh, all the laws of nature themselves just suddenly popped out of nothing one day for no, no apparent reason. Uh, and we call this titanic event uh, the Big Bang. And we don't even begin to understand the Big Bang even though we, we keep, keep tinkering with all the, uh, uh, the, the different parameters in expansion, for, in for instance. But again, the Big Bang we all know is really uh, not an explanation at all. At some point, virtually everyone has thought, this doesn't really work, this doesn't really explain anything fundamentally, not really. So when it comes right down to it, science is amazingly good at figuring out how the parts work. But what eludes us is the big picture. We create these exquisite technologies from our ever-expanding knowledge of the physical processes. We do badly in just one area, which unfortunately encompasses all bottom line issues. And that is, what is the nature of this thing we call reality, this universe as a whole? In any honest summary of the current state of explaining the universe as a whole, it's a swamp. In this Everglade is one where alligators of, of common sense have to be evaded at every turn. So some scientists insist that the theory of everything is just around the corner and that we'll eventually know everything and any day now. And this isn't going to happen, and it, and it hasn't happened for a reason. And that is, is because we've shunted a very critical component out of our view. And that component, of course, is, is consciousness. And it's not just a small item. It's, it's not like anything else. Indeed, it's nothing like anything else. Consciousness is awareness. It's perception. And in an utter mystery, we think we, it somehow just arises from goo. So how did inert random bits of carbon ever morph into that Chinese guy who always wins the, the hot dog eating contest? <laughs> so, so in short, the, the attempt to, to explain the universe, its origins, its parameters, and what's really going on requires us to understand how the observer, us, uh, how our presence plays a role. So at first this may seem impossible, since much of consciousness still is mysterious. But as we shall see, we, what we, we can use what we know and what we are increasingly learning to formulate models of the universe that make more sense for the first time. So undeniably, it's the biological creature that makes the observations that creates the theories. And our entire education system, indeed the construction of language itself, revolves around that bi bottom line mindset that assumes there's a separate universe out there, which each of us individually arrives at on a very temporary basis. It's further assumed that we accurately perceive this external pre-existing reality and we play little or no role in, in, in its, in its uh, appearance. However, starting in the 1920s, the results of experiments have started to show just the opposite. So the observer, it turns out, critically influences the outcome. An electron, again, as I mentioned earlier, can be both a particle and a wave. But how, and more importantly, where that particle will be located, depends on the actual act of observation itself. And again, this is very most famously uh, illustrated in the two-hole experiment, which has been performed so many times in so many variations that it's conclusively been proven that if you watch a subatomic particle or a bit of light pass through two slits in a barrier, it will behave like a particle. And it creates these solid-looking hits on a barrier uh, that the physicists can measure. And so like a bullet, it goes through one hole. But again, if you don't observe its tra trajectory, the particle then exhibits the behavior of a wave and, is a, and can go through more than one hole at the same time. And since then, the, the list of paradoxes and intractable problems has continued to grow, starting with those accompanying the Big Bang. For instance, how could the entire universe just arise out of nothingness? 